Book of Acts. How many of y'all been enjoying this teaching? I think this is number 10, and we're not even finished with chapter 2. So this is going to be like one of those Book of Revelation teachings where we're just going to go forever and ever and ever. And uh, I hope that's okay with you. Because uh, I believe you learn so much more. Remember Mama used to say, chew your food slowly? I, I don't listen to that very much, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we chow down, right? But, you know, when... when it was a truth, though. It kept you, uh, kept you healthy and whatever. But uh, we need to chew on the Word of God. We need to go slow sometimes to really get to the meat of it and enjoy it, okay? So that's what we're doings. We are doings that, and we're enjoying it so much. Again, I love everybody. Welcome live stream and our extended family, those that will be listening on uh, YouTube and those uh, on Archive. We just appreciate you. All right, the book of Acts, Kingdom Perspectives. This is Wednesday night teaching. Last time we got together, we said the baptism of the Holy Ghost changed the way the Word of God was to be, be, be preached forever. I mean, it changed it. Jesus is the prince of all preachers. There's no greater preacher than Jesus. I, I would, you know, uh, some people say, well, I wish I was back in those days. You know, again, I told you I'd rather be in these days because I get to feel the Lord and be with him more uh, than I could with a crowd. But I would have loved to hear him preach as far as his ability to preach, it was uh, just imagine tremendous. But when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came, the preaching of the gospel exploded. It changed. And these, these guys uh, that were mild and timid and, and even a rough around the edges like Peter, man, they became dynamite powerhouses for God. And so that's what the baptism will do for you. So the event changed the governance of religion. Remember that? from lethargic control to fiery freedom in and with God. So it took, it took religion or the word of God. It took, you know, the whole access to God, the whole teaching of, of the word of God, the whole teaching of who God the Father was, the creator. It took it out of the hands of the lethargic Pharisees and Sadducees and, and the Sanhedrin type of people and gave it into those that were on fire, man, and uh, just gave us wonderful fiery freedom to where we could could learn and preach and and live this wonderful truth by the power of of the Holy Ghost. So, a lot happened on the day of Pentecost. And then I said the church was born, and her message was branded in this fiery experience called Pentecost. It was an indelible mark absolutely an indelible mark. The church was transformed. It was never, never to be the same. When I say the church, I'm talking about the, the people, the whole existence of the church. Remember, the church existed in the Old Testament. Don't have time to go through all that, but it, it's in there. But the church of Jesus Christ in the New Testament was birthed in, in this whole Pentecost experience and in fire. And, uh, you know, that brand is still on you and me. We're branded for a purpose. We're, we, we don't have just some little tattoo. We're branded by the power of the Holy Spirit when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and, and you're infilled with that glory. There's something that happens to you that you just can't fit in with everybody else. It's not that you're some, you know, you're so, somebody better per se. It's not that. It's not an, an exclusive thing. Uh, it's, it's because you just can't fit into the mold of a normal, boring, backslidden, lethargic, lukewarm church. You're branded. Uh, how many of y'all ever done that? You've, you've, you search for a church and you happen to go one and it has nothing like you at all and you just felt, I mean, you're just, yeah, it didn't work, did it? It's like a shoe too small, like four sizes too small. And you, you, you couldn't wait to get out of there. I've been in churches where I actually walked in and left. <laughs> Step in and go, whoa, what did I just do? <laughs> oh, my gosh, I don't belong here. Uh, so anyways, that, that takes place. 
And that's because you've been branded. You know, again, it's not this superstar thing. You love everybody, but you just can't hang. All right, so Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we went in there that, that John, you know, he preached re, uh, repentance. Remember that? In the spirit of Elijah. And Jesus came doing what? Preaching repentance. You know, it amazes me that the church today doesn't want to preach repentance because it's not trendy, it's not popular, it's not fashionable, it doesn't bring in big bucks, whatever they think, and all these different uh, excuses for it. But this is exactly the kingdom message is to repent. If I'm going to go to the world, I'm going to tell you Jesus loves you. You don't have to go to hell, but you got to repent to get there. I can't change that anyway. I can't. It's not a Rubik's Cube where you try to fit your you know, false doctrine to fit the world. You got to tell it the way it is. And the way it is is that Jesus, he died on the cross and he died uh, for your sins and you have to receive him as Lord and Savior and repent of your sins and let him help you uh, live a righteous life through the power of the Holy Spirit. But we don't want to do that in the modern church because it's just not trendy and we think it offends people. Really? The gospel will offend you. You know, when I was living in sin and people tried to preach to me, I was offended I was offended. I knew I was going to hell, but don't tell me I'm going to hell. How dare you? <laughs> I'll, I'll get there myself. I don't need your help. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? I had enough religion in me to get mad at them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll box your eyeballs in, mister. On my way to hell. But you see, if you love somebody, and you know it's the truth. That's why I love hanging out with you guys, because you guys are real. You're transparent. And, and, None of you, no, never mind, I'm not going to go there. But, you know, I, I love being with you guys because, you know, you make this thing so easy because it's truth. It, it, it's hard to be fake. It's hard to be fake. It's hard to act like you're religious. Anyways, that's what the church, the fake church does. But, uh, you know, you got to tell them to repent. That's the message. I love you, man, but you, you got to repent. Sorry, there's no other way. You want to get into this kingdom, you got to repent. So Jesus did that. And then the first message of the church was repentance. I already went over this. Remember, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, talking about the baptism was a pawn. How many of y'all like that? Did it help some of y'all in your theology? Because it'll help you too with speaking to people who are caught up in that oneness apostolic kind of teaching. And remember, when you speak about apostolic, there, there's two understandings of apostolic. One is the oneness movement that is totally separate from what the Word of God says. And then and there's true apostolic ministry in which I'll teach on at another date and may mention a little bit tonight. Okay, Matthew chapter 28, 19 settles for me. So you know what I do when I baptize people? I baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost and in Jesus' name. There you go. I just covered it all. So you should make it to heaven on that. You know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But that's what goes on in the church. Okay. Then uh, first, first Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 10.2. I want to touch on that again because that talked about what? The baptism unto Moses. The baptism unto Moses. That's going to fit this next part of the teaching I'm going to give you. It's very important that we learn that. There's nothing cultic, crazy, uh, anti-truth, any, any, anti-scripture. Anti there's, there's none of that. There's all truth. 1 Corinthians 10, 2. It talked about that when they went through that with Moses, something happened. Something changed and something churned with the children of Israel and Moses. And we have to do that in life with our pastor. We have to do that with our leadership. We have to do that, number one, with the Father. We have to be baptized into the, uh, to that ministry, understanding that he is that leader and our God, our God and our guide. So that's a whole other teaching for uh, leadership, but I will touch a little bit on that. Okay, so then the final thing was, man, Peter preaches up a storm. He is hitting them historically. He's hitting them with right hooks prophetically. I mean, he's body slamming them with truth. And, and I'm going to try to give you a little better understanding of what Peter did on this day because so many times we read the Bible so lethargic. We just say, and then they did this, and then they did that, and then, and we never take our imagination and try to paint a picture, and the Holy Ghost will do this for you if you, if you ask them to, paint a picture of where they were at the time and how this all came about. Then you get this tremendous picture of what really took place, and it gives you what? Revelation. And that's what we're missing in the church because we got Dr. Feelgood that wants to stand up and just be lethargic and act cute with Hebrew, Hebrew and Greek words when there's so much more to it. Okay, uh, so what did he do? He preached and 3,000 people got saved. 
Wow, that's powerful. I've been in some mighty meetings before, and I've seen thousands of people born again. But to imagine that one service in the situation that he was in, to see that take place is amazing. All right, the book of Acts for tonight, the book of Acts. Let me give you these couple opening statements. The day of Pentecost started the revolution of truth that set the world on fire. The day of Pentecost started the revolution of truth that set the world on fire. I'm watering up because I'm fixing to go long-winded here, all right? So you're in trouble. The day of Pentecost started the revolution of truth that set the world on fire. I mean, the truth came out. Look again, when Peter preached, it was like a flamethrower. He preached, man. He laid it out. He used David as an example. He used the whole reason why they were there at Pentecost. He used everything he possibly could, and there was a revolution of truth that took place. And we can tell because 3,000 people were born again. That's a pretty powerful revolution, don't you think so? And the most religious place in the world, think of this. It would be like me, me preaching at some religious cult headquarters in, in their foyer or in their courtyard or at the Vatican, and all of a sudden 3,000 people really got saved and filled the Holy Ghost. You've got to think that way because this was in Jerusalem. This was at the high time of their feast. And all of a sudden, the power comes and these people get saved. You better believe Peter preached very powerfully, but he also had a major anointing on him. So watch this. The next thing, the fire of his presence, talking about the Lord, the fire of his presence that burned in the Old Testament now burned within the heart of of everyone who receives him. The fire of his presence that burned in the Old Testament now burned within the heart of every one who received or receives him, and that would be the Holy Ghost. Watch this, because the fire that burned in the Old Testament, we're talking about the presence of God. Remember, in the tabernacle, his presence was there. Remember, wherever they went, the presence of God was there, right? Cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night, and his presence was there in the tabernacle to the point where the priest had to have a rope tied to his leg with a bell because if he didn't sacrifice properly or he had something going on on the side, he would die. Remember that? The bell stopped, you better yank the rope. Pull that man out of there and get you another priest. But the presence of God was there, so that fiery presence had come on the day of Pentecost, and guess what? It burns in everyone who receives him. This is what's amazing, and I think we water it down and we miss the whole thing, is that the very presence of God that we read about in the Old Testament, you know how many times we read about Moses and the fiery bush and all these things, and we go, wow, man, God, that's awesome. And we're just totally amazed at God and what he did with the prophets and how he, you know, he visited and, and, and all these things he did and talked with Abraham and so on and so forth. Then we come down to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we water that thing down, not recognizing, realizing that's the same spirit that's in you right now. Whoo, glory to God. The same Holy Ghost, man. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. He quickens. He makes alive your body. He makes alive your spirit, man. Man, we water this thing down. We water it too much. So, the, so the, uh, the fire of his presence that burned in the Old Testament now burns within the heart of everyone that receives him, man. Wow, you should pray in the Holy Ghost every day. You should pray in the Holy Ghost all the time. You should worship God, worship the Holy Spirit, say, God, thank you so much for your wonderful spirit. Every day, just take time, walk the floor, and just lift your hand and say, Lord, thank you for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You should be asking for a fresh infilling. Come on. Wow. So Peter didn't preach just a good sermon. Write this down. Peter didn't preach just a good sermon. He made a decoration that Jesus is alive, he is Lord, and he was the only way to heaven. Peter didn't just preach a good sermon. He made a decoration. He stood in the most religious spot of the day, and he made a decoration. He pointed that fisherman's finger towards all those religious folks 
One side thought they were drunk, the other side were blown away. And he said, let me declare to you, I am making this declaration to you that he is alive, that he is the Lord, and he's the only way to heaven. That's powerful. Keep in perspective, keep in your mind, these were wanted men at one time. In fact, they weren't very welcomed in Jerusalem, but they were there because Jesus told them to. Isn't that cool? So what does that mean to me as I, I, I finish up my statements? It means to me that when I preach and you preach and we, we witness to people, we're making a decoration. We're not just, we're not asking you to get saved. We're, we're, we're not asking for the devil to stop. We're making a decoration and we're saying in Jesus' name, this is the way it is because it has been written. And that's what Peter did. And you can only do that with the power of the Holy Spirit helping you. The only, you can only do it with God and making us bold and making us strong, okay? So it's not on our own flesh. So Acts chapter two, all right, man, we're turning the corner here. We're, go, we're, going, we're going to bring this to the barn. I think I can get it all done tonight. Acts chapter two, verse 42. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about church structure. This is historical, but it's also prophetic. It deals with today. And we're going to see some things of why the church is missing a, a, a lot of what God wants to do because we don't have our structure right. We're out of balance. First of all, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. That's the first thing. And we've, not, we've taken him out of there. We don't have Jesus as chief cornerstone for most churches because we have our business commu community or committee. We have brother and sister big bucks and we have all this kind of influence that's carnal. And, and our, our denominations and our headquarters, they become the chief cornerstone. But when you really make Jesus the chief cornerstone, then you make him Lord of all. And that becomes your firm foundation. So watch this. We're going to talk about that. So uh, verse 42, tell me when you're there. So you know 3,000 souls got saved, right? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So what did they do? They continued steadfastly. You might want to underline that, highlight that, but definitely put that in your notes. Okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something to you, but we're talking about church structure. They continued steadfastly. True apostolic reformation. True apostolic reformation is a call to true doctrine and peer fellowship, not lording over and fleecing God's people. I need to get this out so I can teach a little bit about apostolic for a minute. True apostolic reformation, talking about what's going on today and the reformation that needs to take place, the real apostolic reformation, is a call to true doctrine and pure fellowship. Back to the book of Acts. Back to the basics. Back to the apostles' doctrine. Okay, we're talking church structure. Pure fellowship. Not lording over and fleecing God's people. Now, I've been in ministry for over 25 years. I've seen a lot of things, been around a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of movements of God, and I've seen a lot of church structure in my life. Jennifer's been with me. And there are a lot of those that say they walk in the apostolic, which means the apostles type of power and structure and authority, if you will, but they're really demigods. They're really little gods with a G that want to rule over people tell them what they do, to do, and to be served by them. That is not true apostolic. True apostolic movement of God is when the pastor, the shepherd, or apostle, or whatever how you want to call the fivefold, serves the people, knows their authority, knows their power, knows their giftings, but serves the people, doesn't fleece the people. And you know that some of y'all come from churches before where, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the big guy on campus, you know, and he wants to be served constantly. Well, 
Here, Peter is showing us church structure. The Holy Spirit is allowing us to see this because really he could have stopped right there. 3,000 were saved and they went on. But they gave us a glimpse. The Holy Spirit wrote this, put this in the writing to let us see how church operation should be or church structure. So I want to throw that out first. True apostolic reformation is a call to true doctrine. That's what an apostle should be doing is preaching true doctrine, keeping people safe, keeping people saved, keeping them away from the, 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 the sheep in, in wolves, clothing, or wolves in sheep clothing and all the charlatans out there. That's what a true apostle should be doing, okay? And then it mentions pure fellowship. In other words, loving the church. I told you this many times. My mentor, the late, great Dr. Lester Summerall said, if you're going to be a shepherd, you got to smell like sheep, and how many of y'all know that sometimes you go to churches and you, you don't even see the shepherd? He's ushered in and he's ushered out and, and, and it's, it's just craziness. And I've been around all that stuff and I don't like it. I don't like it. Uh, to me, I don't care if you have 10,000 people, you ought to find your way down the aisles. Come on now. I'm serious. I, it, it, it's, 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 it's an epidemic today in the church, and that's why we have a disconnect between the true doctrine because we don't have pure fellowship from our pastors, the apostles, and the fivefold because they think they are the Kardashians of the kingdom. <clears throat> so I'll just move on. That's not what this teaching is about tonight. But I had to lay that out. So watch this, verse 42 again. And they continued steadfastly. Everybody say steadfastly. It means that they were devoted. I want you to write this down. The number one key is they were devoted. This needs to be taught in the church today. Well, I want to see all the revival. I want to see all the... Get in your place. Get in your position. If your assignment is at post A, be at post A. Be where you're supposed to be. Do what you're supposed to do. You have an assignment. But they continued steadfastly. They were devoted. That's what it means. That's the definition. They were devoted. They were devoted to the doctrine. They were devoted to the apostolic leadership. They were devoted to what Peter had to say. And that's so important. And it's so missing in the church today. Because people get moved around by every wind and doctrine. They get moved around, moved around by every offense. One minute they're charging in, man, I'm devoted, I'm devoted. Next thing you know, their place is gone. You don't even see them anymore. Because there's no true devotion. There's no true devotion. There's no true commitment to the preaching of the gospel. And I'm not talking about just your position in the pew, in the chair. I'm talking about people who once believed the right way of the word of God. They once believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but something happened and somebody stepped on their blue suede shoes, broke their pump all the way in here, you know, on the way into the church, broke their pump and they're mad and somebody, you know, tore their britches. How I many all Southern folks know what tore britches means? Tore your britches and now you don't come back to church or you won't serve God. Elder about fell out. You're not, <laughs> she's like, I tore my britches many times. <clears throat> I used to be told that all the time. You tore your britches with me. I was like, really? Well, you better cover up then. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I've tore a lot of people's bridges by being bad, saying the wrong thing. But, you know, leaving the first love, leaving the doctrine, leaving truth because somebody did something to them or whatever. It could have been pastor saying something or didn't say hey or whatever it is and then lose the position they have because they're not devoted to truth. Listen, when you're devoted to something, you'll duke it out. That's how you stay married for 20 plus some odd years. You just deal with it. You duke it out. You got an issue, you deal with it. You fix it. Come on now. Or you get on top of the roof to it all settles down, one or the other, but you fix it, you deal with it. And so this is, this is what he was showing us here, and I believe this is why he, laid, he left us in here. So what? So they continued steadfastly in what? In the apostles' doctrine. Now the word apostles, though, let me read it to you. Uh, it's spelled A-P-O-S. I believe that's, T yeah, that's L-T-E-S, Apostolus, Apostolus, 652. Look that up, Apostolus, 652. Now watch this. 
They were steadfasted and they were devoted to what? To the apostolus, which means delegated ones or one that is sent. Now, I can go into further teaching the apostle later on. We get into the fivefold because there's so many of the different names that applies to it. It also means an emissary or like an ambassador. You represent the kingdom. The apostle is a, is a very powerful uh, uh, gift uh, of, to the church, and I do believe in them. I do believe that they're real ones, but uh, there are some that <clears throat> they're, they're just make-believe. Uh, they're, they're a bishop of a business card. And uh, so we're, we're not going to get into that tonight. But they were delegated people. So they were devoted to the delegation. They were devoted to those who were put in their lives as an authority. This goes back to being baptized under Moses or into Moses. They were devoted to it. They said, man of God, Peter, Peter and the gang, hey guys, we see that you're from God. We see, we testify, we watched it, we witnessed it, we experienced it. We are born again underneath that ministry. We're born into that, uh, to the kingdom. We get it and we see that you are, deleg- you are delegated from God. You are sent from God and we're devoted to you. That's powerful. And that is missing in a lot of churches today because there's very, there's little, very, very little commitment and passion from the pulpit and very little devotion and dedication from the pew. And that's a bad mixture. And you know what people are doing? They're just getting along the best they can every Sunday. <laughs> Don't you know that's the truth? That's not here now. You know, no, it's not. I know it's not. It's not here. We don't have that here. We're not a perfect people, but we don't have that issue. And I thank God for that. And we've never had that issue since we've been in together, since I married you all. Y'all married me. No, seriously, I, I, I can testify to that. But you know that you hear from your family members the bickering and the fighting and the fussing and the cussing going on about carpet and bleh. it's it's It's, it's puke. And it shouldn't be, and I'll tell you why. It's because there's no devotion and there's no dedication. They don't respect that who's been given to them is delegated. And it doesn't work in most denominations because most guys are hired. And buddy, they sit there and they think about it. They say, oh yeah, next year we're voting your bum out. Yeah, and they do. They do think that. Well, just tolerate them one more season. (laughs) Then it's U-Haul to Texas. Or wherever. And you know that's the truth. And I've been around denominations and they do that stuff. Okay, so I painted that picture to show you how they were devoted and how they, they understood that these were, they were delegated. Remember, it means he that is sent. Okay? The mission and the, and the message is not self or denomination, but of Christ in heaven. The doctrine wasn't denomination. The doctrine wasn't about Jerusalem. The doctrine wasn't like these other dudes. The doctrine was all about Jesus. It was all about heaven. The message, the ministry, the mission was everything that Jesus began to teach and to do was being given to the apostles to pass on to these new converts and to those who just got born again. So that's very powerful to see. So now we're watching church structure here. Look at the next thing that is said. And fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayer. Fellowship, write this word down. K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. K-I-N-O-N-I-A. Koinia. Koinia. 2842. Koinia. K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. I got my writing board back there, but there's just no way for the camera to catch the writing. So I apologize. One day we'll work a system out to where we can can do that and have another camera or something because I know it's a lot easier when I write it for you. But koinia, why is that important? Because it's part of the structure of the New Testament church. This is a snapshot trying to get us some building blocks to what was taking place. Koinia means community. It's actually fellowship. But it leads into community, fellowship, koinia. It means you like hanging out with each other. There's powerful koinia in this church. There has always been koinia in this church. I may not like everything you you like and you might not like everything. I, I mean, we have differences. We're all different. Maybe you should have thought these walls should have been 
purple or pink. I don't know. Or a strobe light somewhere hanging, a disco ball. I don't know. We all have our different, different things. But the koinonia keeps us together. That when we do have differences, we just say, ah, well, he's a knucklehead and we'll get over it. And, oh, God, forgive me. I didn't mean to say that. Sue's about there laughing about the busted gut. I mean, isn't that true, though? Can we laugh at ourselves for just a minute? And let's be honest, those watching a live stream, we are that way. We, we, we tolerate each other. I, I did a teaching on this many years ago, but we tolerate each other, you know, in order to fulfill the, the total goal and the vision. And that's life. You, you do that every day. You go to work with people, you'd like to throw them out the first story, story window into some bushes to where they don't get too hurt, maybe scraped up. But, but, you, but you don't because, number one, you don't want to lose your job. Number two, you don't want to go to jail. And then three, you don't want to get in trouble with the father. You just don't do stuff like that. So what do you do? You tolerate. You tolerate. Somebody's going, amen. Amen. Throw them down a, throw them down a one-step stairway or something. You know, but your flesh, your mind, you whatever, you deal with stuff like that, you may struggle with that. But the issue is this, you tolerate so that you can get through it, okay? And koinonia, now let's flip that over into the church. We're spirit-filled, we love God, we walk in the fruit of the spirit, but we have fellowship with one another. We have koinonia, we, we just love each other regardless of some of the things we may not understand about each other because none of us is perfect, but we're being perfected, all right? So they, they were in, watch it now, they were devoted, they were uh, devoted to, uh, to the preaching, to the doctrine of the apostles, and to the fellowship. So they were devoted to what? They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to koinia. They said, hey man, I'm going to hang out with you. I may not understand everything about you, but I am going to have a community. I want you to write that word down, community, okay? Because here's the definition the share which one has in anything. The share which one has in anything called joint participant or joint participate. This is very powerful because this is missing again in the church because most churches are robotic. I'm waiting for a church to come with a uh, revolving door. I don't know if any has any yet. Uh, let's see. I've been to the one in New York Times Square. I don't think it has. I think it was a big grand door. That's a beautiful church. We only looked through the window at that time where David Wilkerson used to pastor. One, one time he went to New York. But uh, yeah, I wonder if they have that because it's so robotic. You just spin in, you find your chair, you go through the motions, you don't know anybody, you don't have any fellowship with them. Oh, you may go to the coffee shack at church and, and have a couple cups of cold uh, or coffee with them, and whatever, cold drink. And, and that's really about it. And you don't have that much koinia. There's not much of a community. How many of y'all ever been in a, in a mega church? I've been in a mega church, you know, I'm, I'm talking 5,000, 10,000 and higher. Those are mega churches, you know. Some, sometimes they say 2,000, 2,500. You know, it's hard to have real community because number one, I, I, I think it's, it's because something's going on behind the pulpit that creates that, that atmosphere. I think you could have Coronia in a 10,000 member church. I think you could. It's all up to the pastor. It's all up to him. You know, it's up to him if he wants to be escorted out the back every time instead of mosh pitting it with the people. <laughs> Just having a good time. Say, hey, I love you, man. You know, you, you can be used wisdom and be protected at the same time. So, we're, we're just showing, we're showing this structure here because this is, again, what's missing. So cornea, the community, meaning the share which one uh, has in, in anything, joint participation or, or, you know, joint community. In other words, I am in the same boat with you. We're all trying to make it to heaven as far as, you know, live right and be, walk in holiness, do the right thing. We're trying to, 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 to please the Father you know what? We're going to have koinonia where we're community. I love when you guys bring stuff in. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, give some, you know, high praises to this church. I don't know what other churches do, but I love when you come in here and there's stuff in the back or on the table here to give away, whoever it may be. I'm not going to single anybody out because we all try to do something. You know, if we got a little extra or something, we bring it to the church, not because we feel bad for you, don't look at your neighbor. Uh, we bring it in because we love each other, and it's, it's a sense of community, okay? Very powerful. I'm waiting for you all to bring my Bentley one day, and then we'll really know. 
Let me get some water. It's getting a little dry over here. It's getting painted, I heard. Anyways, I don't want no stinking Bentley, please. All right, so it's community. See how you can just cornea laughing and enjoying each other and somebody not getting offended. But I guarantee somebody end up writing me at some point about something. They, they have no idea. They don't understand humor. They don't understand love between one another. They don't understand a pastor and his people. They just, they don't get it. Okay, so look at the next thing. This is structure. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and what? Breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. This is another powerful thing. Write down community and then write down fellowship because this is the proof of it. The proof of fellowship, the proof of community, it's right here, the breaking of bread. And I'm going to give you that word for bread. R-T, excuse me, R-A-T-O-S. R-T-O-S. R-A-T-O-S. A-R-T-O-S. I think I said it wrong the first time. Sorry, I was trying to read it in O-S. A-R-T-O-S. Yes, 740. Artios. Artios. Okay, this is important that you hear this. The breaking of bread, A-R-T-O-S, because it deals with the love feast, it deals with the Lord's table, and it's not speaking only of communion. Watch this. It's a love feast, the Lord's table, and it's not just communion because the word means food of any kind. So look at the structure. They were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. Now notice that they didn't, they didn't have devotion first for food. They didn't have devotion first for the fun stuff. They had devotion to the word of God. Okay? They moved into the cornea. They moved into breaking of the bread. Now this is powerful because in this understanding that it wasn't just communion, they hung out and ate with each other. They hung out and fellowship with each other. And that was a very important part of the structure of the beginning church of the New Testament. Okay? So look at it again. They were in the apostles' doctrine. They followed it. They were steadfast. The fellowship and the breaking of bread. So again, that meal was not just the communion meal. That was the fellowship of, of breaking bread together. That's koinonia. When you fellowship together, when we have dinner on the ground at this church, or, or if we're able to go out or whatever, and it, that's fellowship. That's wonderful fellowship. We break the bread together spiritually, the word of God, but then there's times we break bread. I'm going to tell you, some of my funnest times at this church is going back there and eating with you guys. I mean, it's, it's a blast. Just watching Mike pile up the food on this plate and then look at the mathematics of gravity and wonder, how does that plate not break? And then you look at his biceps and you're like, okay, I understand now. See, you could pick on Mike, it's easy. But is it not true? That's some of the greatest times we have. I mean, we love our services together and our worship together, but there's something about breaking bread. And this is what was established in the apostolic doctrine, the whole structure of the first church. And this is what should be a part of the apostolic reformation of the hour, is getting the pastors and the leaders and the fivefold back with the church and the church back together devoted and having koinonia with one another. We're missing it. It's bad. It's very bad in the church today. It's, 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 it's like two people living together in separate rooms and they're married. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay. So this is part of structure. Remember, a, a river without banks is a what? It's a swamp. So if you don't have these structures, then you have a swampified, if you will, church. You have a church that's just anything goes. There's no structure. There's no respect for the pastor. There's no respect for the leadership. There's res no respect for the house of God. It's just showing up because you need to put your time in so you make sure you and the man upstairs are doing all right. How many of y'all ever heard that stuff before? Can't stand that. So let me give you this in a bullet form. So number one, this is structure. Number one was the teaching. 
We're, we're taking it from this verse, and I got to move on. Teaching, number two, fellowship. Number three, communion. I put communion in there, but that's breaking of bread. That's fellowship. That's love feast. That's hanging out with each other. But communion is just easy to, to put it there. Number four was prayer, and we're going to get into that, but I want to finish the bullet points. And number five is community. And if you'll put a plus sign between all of these, at the bottom, make an equal sign and write church. Teaching plus fellowship plus communion plus prayer plus community equals the church. That's what it is. And I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't be a part of any other type of church. I don't care if I were offered six figures to go be somewhere at some whatever, whatever. No way. I would never trade what God has given us. No matter how many noses or whatever, it doesn't matter to me. The cornea, knowing that the Spirit of God is in the house and knowing that there's that wonderful connection, everybody that comes here feels that. Okay? So watch this. I got to move on. And they continue steadfastly, breaking the bread. And watch. And in prayers, they were people of prayer. They were in people of prayer. They prayed. They got together and they prayed. Imagine that. They just prayed. They prayed for one another's needs. They prayed. Like we do here, we pray. They were people of prayer. And what I love about this is it was all new to them. What do you pray? You don't have a Bible in front of you. All you have is the testimony of the apostles who walked with Jesus. And they watched him pray. Remember, he said, they said to him, teach us how to pray. And so they were preaching some, or praying some of the most pure prayers of their hour and of their day. But regardless, they were people of prayer. I would sure hope that when I ask for someone to pray for me, you all would pray. And I know you do. And I know you pray all the time. And we pray for one another. I pray for you guys every day, whether I mention your name or not. I, I clue the Ignited Church, everybody watching me right now, anybody that's ever sent a letter, any name that's upon this cross, I pray every day and plead the blood of Jesus over them and ask God to surround them with the heaven's best. Amen? That's powerful. All right? And we should do that. So, okay, let me go on. Verse 43, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now, that word fear there means great fear and trembling. That, that is really the way it should be translated. It's a bad translation of King James, but it should be great fear and trembling came upon everybody in Jerusalem. They were like, whoa, <laughs> You got to remember, go back in your imagination. Here's the most religious place on the earth. They just crucified Jesus. And can I tell you something? Another reason why they were in fear? It's a disservice, I think, in the English language or the way you say it when you say they crucified Jesus. Peter preached to them and said, you murdered him. I think when we say crucify, we get this anesthetic, septic, you know, uh, the, the sterile thing, oh, he was crucified. No, he got up and said, you murdered him. And they were all, whoa, that's what it says. They were knocked out of their mind, per se. And remember, some said, what shall we do? Oh, my God, we murdered him. You're right. And so great fear came upon them because of all this, signs and wonders and miracles, yes, but also because they were guilty of what they did. Wow. So that's amazing. So great fear and trembling came upon everyone in Jerusalem. The word fear there is P-H-O-B-O-S, P-H-O-B-O-S, phobos. 5401, where we get our word phobia. That's where phobia comes from. It's a Greek word, phobos. P-H-O-B-O-S, 5401. Phobia, it means dread and terror. They were in terror. Because not only did he call them murderers, and not only did they see the signs and the wonders, the miracles, and, and, and the loudness of the, of the day of Pentecost, they were convicted by what Peter said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Tremendous dread, okay? So let's move on. 
verse 44, and by the way, this should be happening today. We should be preaching the gospel in such a way that it brings people to a place where they better make a decision for Christ. They better hear this message and say, oh, 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 this is real deal. This is going down in our nation. This is happening or what have you. So it verifies. This is one of the things that a, uh, the scholar said about verse 42, and I want you to write this down. They received it, they retained it, and they acted on its principles. Talking about the apostles' doctrine, watch it. They received it, they retained it, and they acted upon its principles. Very, very uh, needful for you to write that down. Okay, so moving along, verse 44. And all that believe were together and held all things common. Everybody say common. Write the word down community one more time. Because now you're seeing community again in the structure of the first church. Together means one thing or one purpose. If you were to look that up in the Greek, it means one thing and one purpose. Everything was in common. One thing and one purpose. They understood the vision. Even though the vision was only hours old, they got it. They understood that the apostles were the delegated authority and they retained it, they received it, they acted upon it and they said, you know what? This is our purpose. We keep everything together. How powerful is that? That's called unity. That's why a lot of churches don't last very long is because they don't have no real unity because everything gets scattered and, and you have all kinds of, uh, of, of fractions and, and divisions in the house of God because everybody wants to rule the world. Remember that song? Everybody wants to rule the world. Okay, so coming together. So that's community. Verse 45, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted to all them, or all men, excuse me, as every man had needed. Can you guys give me five more minutes? Then I, then I don't have to brush this. I can just say it and go. Now, this was a very powerful point, and I'll show you later on this aspect of, was a very special time of the church, and it does not necessarily carry on to our day. Though cults will tell you that, and people say that, well, we need it like they did and sell everything. No, what had happened was, in the time of the great uh, day of Pentecost, when they all came together for this feast, there were homes opened up all through Jerusalem, and the people would give them places to stay for free. It was like one huge community, community of goods. And they would just love everybody and say, come on, man, we're here for the same reason. But when the day of Pentecost came, there was overtime. And things extended and the church was birthed. Now you had people, over 3,000 souls that came from all parts of the earth. They weren't going home. And so the beginning doctrine was this. Let's hold things all common together as a community. And if any man has any needs, well, we're going to come together and we're going to supply that need because, hey, what's Joe from Jacksonville going to do? or somebody from Greece will supply their need. So this is a doctrine that I'm going to show you later on that did not necessarily carry through the birthing and the, uh, the weaning stage, if you will, of the church. So if anybody tries to pull that on you and say, well, you know, we're supposed to sell everything, that's not applicable. That is, that's not applicable. It doesn't work for this hour. If you want to do it, go ahead, but that's not the point. So watch this. They sold the possessions and goods and parted them to all men uh, as every man had need. Notice the wording, as every man had need. That's the reason why. And not everybody sold uh, everything. It was just speaking to those who were helping out. Now watch. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and the singleness of heart. Okay? Now, I'm going to break this down and we're going to get out of here. This is really cool because they got together the power of purpose was born. You want to write that down. The power of purpose was born in the church. When you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you have the power of purpose. You want to do stuff for the kingdom. You want to get up early. You want to stay up late. You want to go the extra mile. You want to work harder because you have purpose and drive and passion inside of you to see it done. It's a fire that burns in you, fire that should always continuously burn in you. So watch this. And they continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, they were together. They had the same mindset, unity, 
one accord. It's the same word used in the beginning when they were in what? The upper room, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were in one accord, one mind. And it continued on. Watch this. In the temple, so they basically took over the temple. They had church where they once were banned. In the court area. And breaking bread from house to house. And they did eat their meat with gladness. So, so let's stop right there. Uh, and then I'll, I'll break it down. They did what? They went in the temple. They had church. And then they broke bread house to house. In other words, they had koinonia. They had fellowship. They loved one another. When they weren't meeting at the temple, they, they might have met together, you know, at, at another time. Or the fellowship at another time. It was something very powerful. I hope that when you leave church, you don't walk the other way at Walmart when you see somebody from church. Unless you're the pastor and you're busy and you don't want to talk to Sister Shoelace. Y'all be, be, be honest with me. You've never done that before? Oh my gosh. I forgot peanut butter. You don't like peanut butter, but I forgot it. <laughs> None of y'all ever done that? <laughs> Nothing. This Mike won't do that to you. He wants to talk to you. Hold up, buddy. Is he talking to me? What's that? He'll run you down. Mike will run you down or run you over, one or the other. Uh, we love Brother Mike. It's, it's been a good night for Mike. Let me finish this. Watch this. This is awesome. These guys are having an absolute blast. Let me show it, just like we're having right now. Watch this. They with gladness and singleness of heart. You know what that means in the Greek? It means that they were having extreme joy. Look it up. The gladness was extreme joy. Come on now. You've been around some churches, some preacher, some, some people, but you can't, even, you can't even laugh around them. This is serious. Well, I know it's serious, but you look really funny right now. I know this is serious, but I'm having, a, I'm having a good time. So it was extreme joy. Watch this. Singleness means simplicity or sincerity. They really meant it. They really loved hanging out. They really, really loved hanging out. Verse 47, I'm out of here. Praising God and having favor. Favor. Everybody say favor. It really translates grace. Grace is favor. Favor is grace. They had grace. They had favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, watch this. They had such joy, they had such extreme happiness with one another that everybody saw it around them. You got to remember, they were at this religious place and people could not believe, number one, all this that took place. And then watching these guys giggle and laugh and break bread, they were having, listen, they were just born again. You ever get around people who just had a baby? I mean, they act more babyish than the baby. Grown men looking in the window, making all kinds of faces. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. You wouldn't do that. And if somebody paid you a hundred bucks, you wouldn't do it. But if a child comes in the room, oh, you know, that's how they were. They were they were giddy about their salvation, and everybody around Jerusalem was like, "Check these guys out, man! Yeah, sure, you want to use the temple? Go ahead." You want to use my microphone? Go ahead. Somebody said, they had microphones back then? No. No. There'll be a new doctrine out there. Pastor said they got a microphone. No, man, they had a blast like you're having right now, like those watching live stream. They're having a blast. Why? Because that's the joy of your salvation. But guess what? It was happy church. It was fun church, but it was about to change for them. But they had amazing grace. Isn't that awesome? Heavenly Father, let that cornea be upon us. That number one, we learn how to fellowship with you and laugh and enjoy your presence and enjoy all that you've given us. And then let us love each other. We don't understand each other, Father. We do some things that we just can't figure out. <laughs> but we thank you for grace. We thank you for favor. We thank you that you love us equally. And the cross proved that. Father, thank you for this truth. Help us to live it. 
Help us to walk in that structure of a community and the apostolic truth. Father, I pray for this weekend with all seriousness. I pray for souls to be born again through this ministry and through the churches around here. All my brothers and sisters, whether they're Baptists, whatever, if they love you and they know you and they're preaching the gospel, I pray let this Sunday be the Sunday of true conversions, not only in Livonia, Father God, but throughout this entire nation and world. Lord, we love you for that. And thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross of Calvary. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey guys, I'll see you Sunday. Bless you.